Okay, we're back with another Between the Pages book chat, and we're here today with author Jan Katoch. Um, That's as close as I can get to the pronunciation. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to talk about his sci-fi series, um, Central Imperium, and I'm going to turn it over to him and let him introduce himself, so take it away. Thank you, Anita. Well, I am the Czech science fiction writer. I write a uh, science fiction, space operas, military science fiction, and I also write alternate history. And I had 16 books published over in the Czech Republic. And a few years ago, I've decided to hire a translator, a professional translator to pub uh, translate my books in into English. And I have two books published so far on the English speaking market through Amazon and other indie venues, which is the Central Imperium series. and Actually, an hour ago, I was checking some new chapters of the translation of book number three. So hopefully we will publish that very soon. OK, so uh, tell us a little bit about the Central Imperium series, what it's about, um, the plot lines, stuff like that. Yeah, well, the main hero is a gentleman named Daniel Hankerson, and he is a member of the, let's call it, royal family. And but he's like ninth in the succession, so his the emperor is his great uncle or something. So he's happy where he is. He's like an intelligence officer and enjoys playing poker and drinking good drinks and cocktails. Uh, but the Central Imperium is a rather unstable institution. It was created in a power, power vacuum after um, some other aliens who, which ruled humanity were extinct. And so it's and it's built on like so many compromises that it's just hanging by the thread. And there are some external enemies about to use that and some internal as well. And the first time Daniel finds out something is wrong is when someone tries to murder him. And it's staged to look like it's like just a robbery going wrong, but he knows there's something more about it. And then he joins a mission in a new brand new communication chip which can communicate across the light years and they are going to like on the fringes of the imperium that's why the first book is called frontiers of the imperium to sort of like show the flag and remind the locals that they still love them and then of course things go down from there and there's like an invasion from outside of the imperium and more assassination attempts and someone actually, someone described it as Miles for Cosigan meets Star Wars. Yeah, well, and, it sounds sounds uh, very thrilling, with all sorts of conspiracies to be had. Yeah, well, I, the conspiracies in real life are usually just like crazy, but in books, it's always fun to read about them. Yeah. So, um, what were the inspirations behind the series? Well, it's inspiration questions. <laughs> well, it's it's. You know, I think for every author, it's the inspiration of everything he or she ever reads and watches and everything. I like sp good space operas. I, of course, grew up on Star Wars and I like games like Mass Effect. I loved, um, I loved, uh, and I love all kinds of books as a kid. I am fan of the David Weber's Honor Harrington series, Lois Bujold's Miles for Costigan series, and I just. You know, this is just something I would like to read if it were written by someone else. So I was, so I had to write it myself. And I think most writers are something like that. They write stories that mainly they would like to read if they were written by someone else. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think we all do that. Um, so, uh, are do you explore any themes in the in the series? Well, yeah, there is a theme called. Um, well, not called, but it's a genetic, genetic manipulation, genetic enhancement, because um, one of the things that the aliens that used to rule humanity did, they created a new race of humans called Enners, or it's like sh short from enhanced. And they're like a faster metabolism, higher endurance, higher average intelligence. I say average, not every Enner is a brilliant genius. And and they basically were supposed to like rule all the daughter colonies of the Imperium. But then the alien protectors disappeared. And, you know, the Enners in some planets of the Imperium, they still have sort of like the patricial authority. In others, they are just normal people. In others, they were completely extinct. And the 
emperor who is also an ener tries to keep balance into it but and there's it's again a big compromise because the enners they have their own chamber in parliament sort of like the house of lords but these nobles are based on something that can actually be measured and the gene is the energy is dominant so ener ener people will always have ener children and so that's one theme and another th theme definitely is sort of well one of the ways that people tr uh, use position my camera better people use faster than light travel is apart from the normal like hyperdrive they have these giant gates for huge ships that you can pass through and they will transport you thousands of light years away which was built by the old race the protectors but the protectors needed human brains for that they the matrix working on the gates literally needs uh, neurological material from humans or high level primates and one gate took like two million of them. So they basically harvested humans and put them in the gates and the rest of the humanity was using that. And, and when the human emperor took over, they sort of outlawed the, this practice, but they still use the old gates because they have them. So it's like question of morality and like the whole Im Im Imperium is slightly hypocritical, but you know, the gate is there, the people, they are already dead. So, you know, yeah that's that, what that, happens that sounds very interesting uh yeah sort of ambiguous morals there yeah um, and of so... course the, and of course there's like a t time ticking because even though it's it can last hundreds of years the, the neurological material is still organic so it's slowly degrading so there are some factions who say well let's just kill new people to do build new gates and the others say well cloning doesn't work all that much of course you can use monkeys and high level primates but you not even on today earth you will not get 200 two millions of them for one gate so so that's something they're working on now and you know okay okay so Great. uh tell us a little bit about your 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 protagonist your main character what's his best traits his flaws things like that yeah well he's a he's an has an analytical mind he's a intelligence officer and I not, don't mean in the James Bond category but more like someone who sits in an office and reads all kinds of reports that are mutually contradictory and tries to find out the truth and he his skill is that he really can uh, like um, how to say it he can find really fast what makes people tick like what this person what is like what do they want and also he tries to figure out the plots really fast like okay this is the logical thing that that is happening because all the other options does not make sense so i think somewhere between J uh, sherlock holmes but with more uh, easygoing attitude and and i really like most of ian fleming's characters who are really able to like really uh find out what makes people tick and so there's this thing and he sees the whole world as a problem to be solved like a giant puzzle but he finds out in the second book that not all problems are like that and when it concerns suddenly someone pretty close to him he freezes and panics because it's no longer a puzzle to, that he can solve so, so that i think this approaches his weakness as well and oh. and when the situation when he's thrown in a situation that he needs to no longer go into adventures and just stay back he hates it because he feels helpless and he hates feeling helpless well that sounds like an interesting character so uh tell us a little bit about the the world um that you created um is it uh like i have they colonize other planets or is it uh mm -hmm. based in our solar system yeah it's um uh, the central imperium so far has about 90 planet, give, planets, give or take. The Earth is one of them, but it's not the capital. Because I, if I look, if we look at like the historical examples of Earth and which in the age of sales and colonization what became dominant, then, I, then of course the new world, the colonized world of North America became more important. So I said, well, that's probably the capital would be on some other planet. And the fact that we were ruled by some aliens helped that. So the capital and the is a planet called Hub, as a hub in a crossroads, and that's where the seat of the government is. But Earth is an important planet as well. 
And the Imperium, as I said, is a giant compromise in a sense that it tries ver not to fiddle too much in the affairs of the planet. So, for example, if one planet has a legal death penalty, the other has not. You know, no one bothers with that because the empire is too, the Imperium is too fragile as it is. And and of course the military is unified and but and there's some sort of like a parliamentary democracy to sort of resembling the Great Britain, for example, but the emperor has more direct control over the military than let's say in the Great Britain. Cool. Mm -hmm. So um what was the hardest scene for you to write or type of scene in the series? Oh, there were several I remember a lot well one of them i without saying any spoilers one of them i really enjoyed and usually when i enjoyed a lot it's also one of the hardest scenes to write but one of them was when daniel is as i said he freezes he no longer knows what to do and it, for for those few important seconds he freezes and he does not know what to do and he ha and someone else has to help him and that was really a cool scene and and one of the and another one really hard was at the end of the second book which is also available in english already on um, the emperor in exile there's a scene where um daniel has to come to some officers do, who are basically in a state of mutiny and he needs to talk to them and persuade them that they need to join him and these people have more or less not mu not much of a reason to join him and he just needs to use the power of his words and normally when I plot, I try to plot out the dialogue, how the dialogue is going to go. But this scene, I just I decided I cannot do that. I just started writing that scene and I was Daniel and I had to talk. And so I thought and the people replied. And that was I think that's one of the best scenes in the book, but it was pretty difficult scene. OK, so what was your favorite scene or type of scene to write in the series? Well, I, I think I mostly just said so, but I I know that I I pretty enjoy every scene that the second char main important character Daniel's soon to be girlfriend Hila Eban is because she's just fun to write. She's like slightly psychotic journalist slash ex commando, also with sort of superpowers but different, and she's just fun. She sort of deals with most problems in very straightforward way ways and and at the beginning of book three which is coming out soon there is one wonderful scene with Hilla and that was that's my favorite scene and lots of female readers really love that scene and lots of male readers don't like that scene that much and when people read that they will probably figure out why <sighs> well there's an but, intriguing thing to get the people to read the book yeah yeah but i love that i loved writing that scene you know i'm okay with that but i was just happy that it was not happening to me <laughs> okay so yeah so go 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 buy the book and read it to find out what happens in that scene yeah okay so um uh do you have a favorite character um daniel and hilla are probably on equal footing now i love both of them and, okay, so we have the, a question mm -hmm. from the audience. So sorry to interrupt here. Okay. Okay, so how much planning did it take to create the worlds you've created? Have you created some of your own species? Okay, thank you for the question, Mike. So as for to the first question, I, I remember I'm, I'm a plotter and outliner. So I was writing notes to this series while I was finishing my previous series in Czech. So when I did not feel like writing first draft of a new novel that day, I was writing this. So it was probably more than a year, but it's just, that was not like work, work. It was writing something here and there and thinking about it a lot. And as for species, I have several alien races in the universe. Some are part of the central Imperium. There are the protectors, of course. Then there are these like my most favorite own species are the Ralgars, which are like secondary antagonists, but some of them are good guys and help our uh, our friends. And Ralgars are like giant lizards that are like this warrior race. And but I 
wanted to sort of tackle the typical cliche in sci-fi where we have this space warrior warriors like the Klingons, Klingons for example, where you there's just all like Vikings, like they always everyone needs to be a warrior, everyone needs to fight, and you wonder how did this these people invent star travel? Why didn't they just not keep killing themselves? Who did how did they invent space travel and interstellar travel? So I invented a symbiont species for these uh, Ralgars, which are called the Imats, which are very benign uh, herd and herd creatures that built all the cool technologies for them. And while uh, Ralgars are busy fighting everyone else and most of all each other, they never harm the Imats because it's like cultural taboo. They protect them. If one clan kills off other clans, they take care of their Imats. And Imats are just protected by the Ralgars. And even if they fight with the humans, the humans actually respect that as well, because they knew that, you know, nothing would unite all the Ralgars against them as killing their symbiotic species. So the so the stupid dumb warriors have these these smart symbionts that they that help them. Well, that's a cool uh, twist on the the sci-fi uh, alien species. So yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. what are your characters afraid of? Well, well, the, apart from the fact that they will, they are going to lose and all of them die. Well, well, I think all of the characters, if if I if all of the characters are sort of thrown by circumstances to situations they did not expect, and they suddenly have responsibility they never imagined having, and the natural human reaction is they are afraid they are going to fail. They are afraid they are not up to it. And so I think that's a common denominator that all of the characters are afraid of this. And I'm not sure if Admir if William F. Halsey said this, but it's ascribed to him, but it's he said that there are no great men, there are just great challenges that ordinary men are forced by circumstances to face. And that's sort of like unifying elements of all of my heroes. Well, that's nice. So um, you've written other books as well as the, the uh, mm -hmm. Imperium series. So uh, do you want to tell us about a few of them? Well, I can. They're, they're all in Czech, so I'm afraid your oh. listeners won't be able to read them. But uh, one of them is a Finnish series of military sci-fi called the Hirano Sector, which is, again, like far future, two factions fighting each, each other. And it was the first series I've written. And then I have a very, in Czech Republic, my most successful series is called The Czech Lands. And it's actually an alternate history where after a global flood in the middle of the 19th century, the Czech Slovak kingdom is a world naval superpower. And it's altern, alternate 19, excuse me, it's alternate 1940s. And uh, basically their uh, Czechs are fighting it off on the high seas with Tsarist Russia where there was no communist revolution, and but the Tsar is industri industrialized Russia the same way Stalin did. So they have lots of lots of battleships and cruisers on the high seas, and the Czechs, Czechs needs to compensate for that number. So they try unproven technology, which is aircraft carriers. And that was a series that no one expected would sell. I actually have framed a letter from one Czech publisher explaining in bullet points why this is not viable for the market and it's my best-selling series and it's always nice when this happens and I think it's sort of made maybe it's playing a little bit on the patriotic side but I'm not pushing that too much or and there is also like in, in Czech literature there is a famous Czech nonfiction writer named Miloš Hubáček who you know, during the communist era in the 70s and 80s, he was the only one who was allowed to publish books about like war in the Pacific, like Battle of Midway and Battle of Guadalcanal. And he was very popular. And I, I read him when I was an adolescent. And while writing this series, I apparently tapped into all the other people who love to read Hubacek and just write fiction for them. So, yeah, well, that's actually that's a that. A book I'm writing right now. Yeah. It sounds interesting. So I think we'll wrap it up here and I'll let you tell mm -hmm. everyone where they can find you and your books. Well, you can uh, find it definitely on Amazon. I normally I would direct you to my website uh, where, where I have a free 
novella in my other series, in the Hirano series. But when I was checking my website a few hours ago, it was down. And I was trying to find out what happened. And I realized that the entire hosting company was a target of a giant ransomware attack. And they're working on it. So it does not influence only me, but thousands of other users. So hopefully, they will sort it out soon. And I will get, be able to give you a link to my website. But so far, you can find me on Amazon and Goodreads. And yeah, so far, I'm Amazon exclusive. So if you have a KDP select on Amazon, you can read me for free. OK, so um, thank you for being here. And hopefully, your website gets back up soon. <laughs> I hope and so, too. Pleasure, ch pleasure chatting with you. And we'll be back next week with some more authors. So that's all for now. Bye. My pleasure, Anita. Thank you.